my church. Grab your Bibles as you're seated, and let's go ahead and open them up to the book of Amos. By show of hands, how many of you have completed your homework assignment, and you were sure to be reading through the materials prior to this morning? Anybody? Raise your hand. You started off a lot stronger on week one than you are today. Come on, church. You know where I'm going. So uh, we're going to pick up in Amos uh, chapter 4. So your homework assignment for this next week was, is to be reading through chapter 5. All right? So chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. And here in chapter 4, Amos magnifies chapter 3 by specifying a number of areas of failure uh, for the people of Israel. In, in fact, there are four sections to this chapter. Each one highlights a different type of failure. So verses 1 and th through 3 would be their failure to care. Verses 4 through 5 is their failure to worship properly. Verses 6 through 11 is their failure to remember. And then finally, verses 12 and 13 is their failure to engage with God. So let's start with verse number 1. There it says, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks, and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. Now Amos focuses in on, from the very beginning, he focuses in on the indulgent rich who, who have taken advantage and they have oppressed the poor among them. And so who, who is guilty of committing this sin? Well, Amos is zeroing in and he says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Of all the renderings to this, I really love how the, the New Living Translation renders this verse because there it says, listen to me, you fat cows living in Samaria. You need to understand that Amos was addressing the wives of wealthy leaders. These people who had become ruthlessly or, or vi have become extremely rich by ruthlessly taking advantage of other people. These society women lounged around all day drinking their wine and telling their husbands what to do. I'm not the brightest pastor there is. But I would imagine that any pastor that would dare call the women in his congregation cows would be looking for a new job probably before the message was even over. So, so why does Amos use this type of language? Why is he using this type of imagery? Well, first of all, it, it's not because the women were overweight and a bunch of heifers or anything like that. I have to make sure I don't make eye contact with anyone because, you know, like, <laughs> pastor just call me a heifer? No. Or maybe, I don't know. It's not because they're overweight. I'm going to preach this way. It's because of their sins. Their gross indulgence of sin was fattening them up for the day of slaughter. That's what he's doing here. That's the image that he's trying to uh, present here. And we see the verbs that he uses in verse number one, verbs like oppress. He, he says crush or, or bring. Uh, and the verb tense there uh, suggests uh, habitual activity. This is an ongoing issue. 
So may you know that indulgence and oppression are two sides to the same coin. If our main concern is about our own comfort, if our main focus is on uh, self-importance, then soon we'll begin to look at other people with contempt. We'll see them as a threat to what we want, or we'll see them as a threat to what we have. I want you to notice the, the punishment that, that, he, that he says here. Uh, he says that these cows are going to be treated like animals and led like herd into bitter exile. In verse number 2, he says, Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. Uh, th this imagery that he's using here with meat hooks and, and fish hooks, it, it's, it's supposed to be descriptive and suggesting how, how violently and humiliatingly that they're going to uh, be thrown out into exile. Ultimately, women and, and children uh, would have hooks that would be placed and fastened in their lips by the Assyrian soldiers, and, and they would be led out of their community in a straight line tied to one another naked. That's how violently and humiliating of a picture that, that the Lord is trying to communicate, calling for us to be aware of our sin and ultimately... An awareness of our sin should lead us to a place of repentance in our lives. The people of Israel, they had a failure to care. But it gets worse. Look, the next one is their failure to worship properly. Look at verse number four. It says to enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings. Make them known, for so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. Amos is referring to at least three faults in their approach to worship. And let me give those to you rather quickly this morning. First of all, their worship had become an exercise in, in self-congratulations. Verse number five, the people were bragging about their contributions. It says, uh, and proclaim free will offerings, make them known. Or if you have the ESV version, it says, and proclaim free will offerings and publish them. Uh, the New Living Translation renders it, then give your extra voluntary offerings so that you can brag about it everywhere. It was all about a show. It was all for demonstration. It was all rooted in, in arrogance and pride and wanting to draw attention to oneself. Oh, I didn't have to give anything, but I chose to give, and look how much I gave. All the attention was focused on the individual. Secondly, their worship ignored the Word of God. Notice the little detail that's there in verse number 5. It says to offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened. Because we don't follow these customs and these traditions and these rituals anymore, we might read past that and nothing really stands out to us. But, but to understand, back in Leviticus chapter 2, verse number 11, or, or Leviticus chapter 7, verses 11 through 14, it clearly states that unleavened bread is what's supposed to be used in offering a thanksgiving offering. And here, they're not using unleavened bread. They're using leavened bread. They're not paying attention to the Word of God. They're not following the instructions in the proper way. Okay, and then thirdly, their worship had become self-satisfying rather than God glorifying. Verse 5 tells us, it says, for so you love to do. What do they love to do? They love to brag about the contributions in which they're giving. They, they, they love to draw attention to themselves. There's no humility. There's no sense of awe of being in the presence of God. Their entire ritual is nothing but an empty charade. Make no mistake going through the motions of worship when the heart is far from God. Going through the motions of worship 
when a life is wrapped up in, with so much unconfessed sin, I think it's deeply offensive to a holiness and the righteousness of our Father. So they had a failure to care, a failure to worship properly. The third thing is they had a failure to remember. Let's continue here in uh, verse number 6. It says, But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all of your cities and lack of bread in all of your places. Notice this next phrase. Yet you have not returned to me. Oh, that's a phrase that's going to be repeated here. He says, Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city, and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Then he says, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And he goes in verse number 9, I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your uh, captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Then he says, I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Five times he uses that phrase, yet you have not returned to me. Using that phrase, he's, he's hammering in about their rebellion towards God. God has been trying, he has been calling his people to a place and to a point of repentance in their life. And time and time again, they refuse to repent and they continue on their sinful path. Israel had, had failed to learn from her history. She failed to learn that, that God was sovereign over nature and that God is sovereign not just over nature, God is sovereign over the course of history. Nothing nor no one is beyond God. And ultimately, God wants repentance. God wants repentance not because he, he, he enjoys seeing people suffer or, or grovel at his feet. Oh, he wants repentance so that he can see a broken relationship be restored to a proper relationship with him. So here they have a failure to care, there's a failure to worship, and then there's a failure uh, to remember. And then finally, we get into these last two verses in 12 and 13, and we see that they have a failure to engage with God. In these final two verses, Amos' argument reaches its climax. Here he exposes the failure which lies behind all other failures. And that is a failure for Egypt to properly engage with God. A failure for Egypt to take God seriously. It says, therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Israel has sinned grievously. And despite the many appeals and calls for her repentance, they refuse to do so. Stubborn and, and stiff-necked individuals they refuse to listen to the call of God to repent from the sin that's in their lives. And quite frankly, it's much like us today. 
much like, unfortunately, many of us in this place today, how many of us are, are walking around in our lives with unconfessed sin just piling up. You're in this continual sin cycle, and yet there's no urgency, there's no desire, there's no desperation in your life to bend the knee, to, to bow before the holiness and the righteousness of God and to confess that sin and to ask for his strength, his wisdom, and his guidance to lead you in a different direction, a direction that honors him and pleases him. But you know that the, the same judgment awaits all of us Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. Everyone will have to stand before God in judgment. Every one of us. Not a single person ex exempt. We all must stand before God in judgment. But here's the deal. Through the atoning work of Jesus Christ, those who repent and, and who turn to him in faith well, they'll receive his forgiveness. They'll receive his cleansing. They'll escape the wrath of God that's being ready to be poured out upon all rebellion. But that's for those who turn to him, those that put their faith and trust in Jesus. For those who don't put their faith and trust in Jesus, then there's no relief when you stand before God in judgment. There's no hope of escape. There's no other way to find forgiveness other than putting your faith in Jesus Christ. It is in Christ, and in Christ alone can you experience freedom from the punishment and the penalty and the presence of sin in our lives. It's the only way. Nothing else. So, so as we work through this through this series and, and we begin to read Amos's account, we need to take time to properly reflect on our own lives and on our own conditions. Because like the people of Israel, we have been called time and time again to a place and to a point of repentance in our own lives. As you sit here today, and as we've gone through elements of worship through the reading of his word, from the singing praises unto him, from worshiping through giving of our tithes and our offerings, now worshiping through receiving his word into our lives. I, I, like, I'm curious, are you receiving that in a proper manner today? Are you good with the Father? What's your spiritual health this morning? Like, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect. None of us are perfect, nor will we ever achieve perfection this side of glory. But there's a work that's to be done in and through our lives. And so we should be spiritually progressing in our lives so that the more that we learn about him, the more that we study him, the more that we know him, the more we come, become a better reflection of his characteristics. Like next week, one of the points that we're going to be looking at is, is discovering that how we treat the Word of God is directly connected to how we treat God. To know His Word is to know Him. To love His Word is to love Him. To obey His Word is to obey God. But, Failure to know the Word of God is failure to truly know God. To disobey His Word is to disobey God. To reject His Word, to reject His teaching, to reject His expectations because it's not culturally acceptable today, whatever it is, it is a rejection not just of His Word, it is ultimately a rejection of God. How we handle his word, how we value his word, is a true reflection on how we value God. So, are you spending time with God? Are you getting to know more and more about God? How is that relationship being strengthened and developed in your personal life? 
Are you disciplined? Are you reading? Not just reading it for reading's sake, but are you reading it so that you can begin to understand what God's Word has to say to the people then, and what did they learn from that, and what does God have to say to us today, and what can we learn from it? May we all have a love and a hunger and an appetite for the Word of God. Because His Word it it brings so much correction into our lives if we'll allow it to. There's a thing that I used to do at other churches. I've never done it here, and I'm not saying that I'm going to do it here, but some churches repeat things, and like before they take up an offering or before they open the Scripture, they say something in unison and stuff. One of the things that I used to do is I used to hold up my Bible, and we used to be like, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because this book, following this book, will keep me from sin, or sin will keep me from following this book. And then I ask God, God, may you bless us as we read your word, or may you bless us as we study your word, and then also may we make decisions today that would honor the reading and the teaching of your word. And the church, I'm, I'm just afraid that we've just fallen into uh, patterns of habit now. You know, we come to church because that's just what we're supposed to do. And we come to church, and like, I'm glad you're here. Like, it'd be really weird with nobody here. Who would I call a fat cow? I mean, no, no, I, like, I am. I'm glad that you're here. But, it, but, it, it burdens me that, that some will, will come, and now I've got to turn this way because you think I'm isolating you, that some of you will come week after week, never bringing your word, never opening up the scriptures, never writing anything down, as though you have some photographic perfect memory to retain everything that you hear. If that's you, I'd love to meet you. I, I just want us to, to develop that, that the pattern and the habit of, of bringing our word, bringing the Bible to church. It seems like an essential thing that we should be doing. It, it seems like it should be a no-brainer. We should just bring the Bible. We're going to church. We, we, hey, praise God, we're actually at a church that uses the Bible. There's plenty of churches you don't have to have one, nor do you have to have a knowledge of one. But we're going to use it. We use it every time. And like, don't blindly put your faith and trust in me because I ain't perfect. I'll get it wrong from time to time. I try not to. But if you're just going to sit there and receive it and think, oh, everything that he says is absolutely 100% correct, you're wrong. I'm going to mess up at some point. But you should be writing this stuff down. And then when you see something, you're like, mm, man, Pastor, you said that. I don't know if that makes sense. Then, then we get together, we sit down, we have coffee. Hey, shameless plug. Uh, the second and fourth uh, Tuesdays of uh, every month, we provide you now a brand new thing, coffee with the pastors. Coffee with the pastors. There's no agenda. There's no Bible study. There's no program that we're doing. The pastors are gathering together at the coffee shop, the one that's right there across from HEB here in town. We're going to be there 9 o'clock in the morning. We'll be there from 9 until 10 or until the conversation runs out. It is us being available to you just to talk. Just to talk. You got a question, you got a concern, you want prayers, you just bored at home, you want some company, then, then come and hang out with us. But here's the thing, like, don't just blindly accept everything that you hear as being true. Because unfortunately, just because something gets proclaimed behind the pulpit doesn't mean it's true. Just because you can purchase a book in a Christian bookstore doesn't mean it's God glorified. Just because you can turn that station, the radio, on to uh, a Christian radio station doesn't mean that the songs that you hear are God glorified. So be careful. Be careful. Have a hunger, have an appetite for the Word of God. Come to church prepared. I, I, just, I just want everybody to have access to the Word of God. And, and there's no reason why we shouldn't have access to it where we're at and where we live. 
I'd love to be able to at some point to tell you, hey, if you didn't bring your Bible today because you were just so much in a hurry to rush out of there to, to get the Bible study and to get to church, that's okay. Grab a pew Bible right there in front of you and turn with me to page whatever. But now we have three different types of pew Bibles, and they're in a totally different translation that, that we don't even use. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do. We're trying to replace our pew Bibles. If you'd like to help us to be able to do that, then we would more than glad take any type of love offering that you love to give to that. My desire is to fill this place with New American Standard Pew Bibles. And then if you have one, or if you don't have one, uh, a Bible, then we're going to encourage you to take that Pew Bible home with you and use it. And then we'll just keep on replacing them, keep on replacing them. Because we want you to have the Word of God. We want you to love God's Word. We want you to be a student of His Word. And may all of us learn great and profound lessons from the roar of the lion. The roar that still echoes today, calling each and every one of us to a place and to a point of repentance into our own lives. So in this moment, we're going to move into our time of invitation. During this time, we don't sing anything. We have music that plays in the background. We're going to just enter into a time of prayer. Staff and I will be up here at the front. We're here to pray with you. Maybe you want to come to the altar and just kneel and pray for yourself. Or maybe you have a word that you need uh, to share with one of us. Hey, this is the time. We're not in a rush. I didn't even preach that long today. There's no real football to go home to go watch. Oh, there is. Yeah, I forgot. There's a new league that started today. But that doesn't matter in eternity. What does matter for eternity is what we do right now, right here. So, Father, help us. Help us to make decisions in this moment to honor and glorify you. God, my prayer is that the altar will be filled with people crying out their confessions unto you. God, I just pray that you are glorified in what you see in us. God, may we live our whole lives in full service and devotion unto you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.